Hello everyone. Today's video is on combination squares. And what triggered this video is a subscriber sent me an email and said, I have an inaccurate combination square. Where can I use this? And I thought, what a great question. So today I'm going to cover combination squares, inexpensive ones and accurate expensive ones and where you should use them and later on where you should never use an inexpensive inaccurate combination square. So let's get going. So to give you an idea just how common these are, I went to the Amazon site and I looked up inexpensive combination squares. I counted 71 different combination squares, all under $20 and one of them even $1.99. And I asked myself, how accurate is a $1.99 combination square? And that's what we're covering today. So let's look at some details now. Now, I have two combination squares. This larger one I purchased in Seattle about 30 years ago, and I paid just over $20 for it 30 years ago. I didn't realize at the time when I purchased it that inexpensive squares, inexpensive combination squares can be inaccurate. And after I came home, I started using it, and I had no end of problem setting up machines, and I'm going to talk about that later on. Uh, a couple of so years ago, I this I had this one gifted to me. This is an expensive. This is a star at a very expensive. Uh, I think I paid a, a, a gifted. I think they're worth about a hundred dollars, um, and it's absolutely dead accurate. So when you spend the money and get good quality machinery, especially 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 for measuring tools, uh, it can make a big difference in your woodworking and in your accuracy. So let's have a quick look at how to quickly check to see if your square is inaccurate. So this is the most accurate way and all you need is a piece of wood. I'm using some MDF that's absolutely flat along the top. I'm going to measure very carefully right up in there and right at the bottom. Then I flip it around and I'm going to align now that mark right up tight against the first uh, right up tight against the ruler here and then down here I'm going to mark it again and the difference is how far that is out and there you can see there's the difference on mine okay so now we have a combination square that's not accurate so what where now can we use this confidently one way we can use it is for marking parallel lines. Now, some of these squares will have a little indentation on the end, and some of them actually have a hole. Now, I've actually drilled a hole in mine so that I could put a pencil through it. Um, but if yours doesn't have a little sort of indentation in the end, you could use either a three-sided file or even a little round file and just make a little sort of half circle or a little triangle in there that a pencil can fit into. And then you can use it for parallel lines like this. So even if you don't have the little indentation in the bottom, you can still use that and just sort of run that across like that. Um, you risk that it may come out if you don't have a little indentation, but that doesn't matter. You're just doing a marking anyway. And of course, if you have the hole, you can measure accurately wherever you want to put that uh, mark in there. And maybe it's going to be a saw line cut. Maybe, you know, it could be all sorts of different things. And now you've got parallel lines that you can work with whatever you're going to be doing there. So that's one thing that you can do with this. So, and carrying on with more measuring, Here's another way, place where you might want to, you know, there might be something, a slot that you're needing to put in something, and you can just use your square, and you put it on both sides like that, and you can either draw that across, and now you've got, you know, two parallel lines, but if you carry on one more time, now you can actually use that to find the center of whatever this square is. So maybe you need to drill a hole or something in there. Um, so that's another measuring option that you can use. So on your table saw, you could actually use it as a stop block. 
But look, here's where it gets interesting. If, you're, if you set this up at one length and you decide that it's a little bit too short or a little bit too long, you can easily adjust that by releasing the, the uh, ruler part of this and moving that back and forth. So you get a very accurate adjustment for cross-cutting and for getting continuous cuts. Now for this example, I don't have the perfect setup, but I think you'll get it anyway. So imagine this is a table flipped upside down and you're building a table and you need to center the top on the legs. So now you set whatever distance that wants to be and now you can set the legs on all, say this side first, so over there, but then on the other side, you, you may have the same distance, so now you're going to be sliding those legs along, double checking them on this side. So all the way along, you can use this as a measuring gauge to align your top to your leg set. Now, I'll be honest, I get very nervous when I see steel close to carbide teeth because steel can chip carbide teeth, even a little bump can sometimes chip a tooth. But all of these inexpensive combination squares, this is all aluminum. This casing is always aluminum. So now you could actually use that and you can hold that, you know, that you can hold that level like that. So you can preset whatever height you want and then draw your blade up to that. Uh, so it's another way of setting up a blade height. So very quickly, here are three places you never want to use an inaccurate combination square. You never want to use an inaccurate square for setting up your joint or fence. So never use a crappy combination blade to try and align the fence with the blade or the base with the blade. On your table saw, never rely on a crappy combination square to set the vertical axis of your blade and never rely on it to set your miter gauge. So the bottom line is this, if you're serious about your woodworking and you want to make quality joinery, boxes, picture frames, furniture, you have to have quality squares. And I recommend that everybody has at least one fixed steel square. They're inexpensive and they're always accurate. If you like the versatility of combination squares, you need to invest in a quality square so that you get quality results from it. This one I only keep around to do videos just like this so that can people see that inexpensive squares are rarely accurate. For all of my woodworking, I rely on those two squares. One of my affiliates, Taylor Tools, sells a PEC line, PEC. They're made in America. They're guaranteed accurate. They're not cheap, but when you consider the investment and what you're going to save in wood and time, they're worth every penny. I'll put a link in the description box and in the article on Woodwork Web. You'll be able to go and check those out. Well, before I go away today, I want to remind you I've got a special video coming up in a couple, three weeks towards the end of this month. I haven't picked a date exactly yet, but if you haven't subscribed, now would be a great time to do that so that you get a notification and remember to click that notification bell so you do get notified when that video comes up. While I'm on the topic of squares, I did another video on squares quite some time ago. Uh, larger squares, how you can adjust them, and it's all sort of along the same theme of squares today. So, and a very important part of woodworking. I'm Colin Kinnett for Woodwork Web. Thanks for watching.